Now it is exactly 1.30 and uh, time to start the second half of our symposium. So welcome back everyone from the lunch break, at least if you're in Europe, the lunch break or another type of break if you're on a different continent. Um, it's, it's an honor to have um, Michael Bronstein uh, present here today as the first speaker uh, in, of the afternoon. He is very famous for his work on geometric deep learning and on, on graph-based learning um, more, more generally. Um, Michael holds positions at the University of Lugano uh, at Imperial College London, and he's also the head of graph learning at Twitter. And uh, he has won uh, an enormously long uh, number of awards or list of awards. I highlight a few, um, five ERC grants, two Google Faculty Research Awards, but also in particular the, the awards by the Royal Society, the Wolfson Research Merit Award, and uh, recently um, an award by the Royal um, Academy of Engineering in form of the Silver Medal in 2020. So he's a highly decorated scientist. We are happy to have you here, Michael, and uh, to learn more about your view uh, of geom geometric deep learning. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Carson, and thank you everyone for, for joining. Really a, a privilege to be here. And I feel a little bit of an imposter because the, the previous speakers had some background in biology. I, I am a computer scientist, so I, 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 I apologize for that in advance. And I should also apologize for somewhat uh, arrogant title, maybe. Uh, but let me try to to, to disentangle this, uh, the meaning what is actually meant by, by uh, geometric deep learning. And uh, to do this, uh, let me uh, start by taking you back in history to around uh, year 300 BC, where um, basically since that time for nearly 2000 years, uh, we use the word geometry synonymously with Euclidean geometry simply because no other types of geometry existed. And this Euclid's monopoly came to an end in the 19th century with examples of non-Euclidean geometries constructed by Lobachevsky, Boyei, Gauss, Riemann, and, and others. And together with the development of what is called the projective geometry, an entire zoo of different geometries uh, emerged. And it happened that towards the end of the century, these studies diverged into disparate fields and mathematicians even were debating which geometry is the geometry and what actually defines the geometry. And interestingly, a way out of this pickle was shown by a, a young German mathematician called Felix Klein. He was only 23 when he was appointed a full professor at the University of Erlangen in 1872. And um, he wrote a research paper, basically a, a research prospectus that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, where he proposed approaching geometry as the study of invariants or symmetries, basically the properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations. And this approach immediately created clarity by showing that different geometries could be defined by an appropriate choice of the symmetry transformations. And he used the uh, language of group theory, which was uh, a kind of new shiny mathematical instrument also born in the 19th century to formalize this approach. And the impact of the Erlangen program on geometry and mathematics broadly uh, was very profound. It also spilled into other fields, especially physics. And um, in physics, symmetry considerations allowed to derive conservation laws from the first principles. The, there is uh, this astonishing result uh, known as the, the Noetherist theorem. And uh, after several decades, uh, this fundamental principle through the notion of gauge invariance, we'll discuss it later, uh, in somewhat generalized form uh, that was developed by Young and Mills in, in the 50s, uh, proved successful to provide a unified framework that describes all the fundamental forces of nature. And this is what we call the standard model. It describes all the physics we currently know today. Gravity doesn't yet fit into this picture, but it's nevertheless remarkable. So uh, I can only repeat the words of uh, another novelist, uh, Philip Anderson, that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, at this point, you may wonder what all these does have to do with deep learning. And uh, the truth is, at least in my opinion, the current state of affairs in the field of uh, deep learning reminds a lot the situation of geometry in the 19th century. And uh, on the one hand, uh, in the past decade, deep learning has brought uh, truly a revolution in data science and apologize for this somewhat irreverent picture. And it made possible uh, many tasks that previously, maybe a decade ago, were thought to be 
beyond reach and in some cases even complete science fiction such as computer vision, speech recognition, uh, unsupervised language translation, playing intelligent games such as Go or more recently protein folding. But on the other hand, we now have a zoo of different neural network architectures for different kinds of data and very few unifying principles. And as a result, it is difficult to understand how these methods are related, which inevitably, as it happens, leads to the reinvention and rebranding of the same concepts and sometimes even bitter fights over priority. So what we need, I think, is some form of geometric unification in this spirit of uh, Klein, uh, Klein's Erlangen program, which I call geometric deep learning. And uh, it has two purposes. First, to provide a common mathematical framework and language to study and derive most successful neural network architectures. And second, give a constructive way, a procedure to incorporate prior knowledge and deductive bias uh, that will allow potentially build future architectures in a principled way. So uh, the, the term uh, geometric deep learning actually made it up for my ERC grant 2015, and it became popular uh, after a paper that we published in the Signal Processing Magazine in 2017. And nowadays, it's almost used synonymously with deep learning on graphs. And one of the frequent questions that I'm asked when I talk about graph neural networks is why do you call it geometric rather than topological, for example? So I hope that this uh, talk will clarify why we call it uh, geometric deep learning. So, if we look at machine learning, uh, at least in a simple setting, it is essentially a function estimation problem, right? So we are given uh, an unknown function, let's say a dog or a cat classifier that we observe on a, a training set, examples of let's say dog and cat images. And we try to find a function that fits well the training data and allows to predict it on previously unseen uh, test inputs. And uh, what happened over the past decade is that the the availability of large high quality annotated data sets such as ImageNet coincided with the uh, emergence of computational power of graphics hardware, GPUs. And this allowed to design a rich class of function that uh, have the capacity to interpolate such large data sets. And neural networks appear to be a suitable choice to represent such broad class of functions, because as we know, even the simplest choice of architecture such as the perceptron that I show here, probably the earliest and simplest neural network, if we combine just two layers of perceptron, we get a dense class of functions, what is called universal approximation. So we can approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. Now, the setting of this problem in low dimensions is a classical problem in approximation theory that really has been studied to death over the past century or so. We have very precise control of uh, estimation errors, number of samples, but the situation is entirely different when we go to high dimensions. And we can quickly see that in order to approximate even a simple class of, let's say, Lipschitz continuous functions, like the example that I show here, where we have a superposition of Gaussian blobs put in quadrants of a unit square, we uh, see that the number of samples grows very fast with the dimension. In fact, it is exponentially fast. And this is a phenomenon that is colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality. And in modern machine learning methods, we need to operate with data that lives in thousands or even millions of dimensions. So the curse of dimensionality is always there, standing behind the corner, making such an naive approach to learning impossible. And perhaps the best way to see it is in computer vision problems, like in image classification, where uh, even tiny images are very high dimensional. But if you look at an image, intuitively, it has a lot of structure that is completely broken and thrown away if we need to vectorize an image and uh, provide it as an input to, to a perceptron. And now if the image is shifted by just one pixel, we see that the vectorized input will be very different and the neural network will need to be shown a lot of examples to learn that shifted inputs must be classified as the same thing, right? And the remedy for this problem in computer vision came from actually works in neuroscience, such as the classical paper of Hubel and Wiesel that, that brought them the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the study of visual cortex in 1981. And they showed that brain neurons are organized into local receptive fields, which served as an inspiration to a new class of architectures with local shared weights, starting from the neocognitron of Fukushima and then probably the most famous architecture, the convolutional neural networks, the seminal work of Jan de Kahn from the 80s. And this concept of weight sharing across the image effectively solved the curse of dimensionality and made CNNs approximately invariant to object translation. Now, let me show you another example. What you see here is a molecular graph, and you've probably seen it already before today. Uh, and this is a molecule of caffeine, if you're uh, interested in. So uh, the nodes here are atoms, and the edges represent chemical bonds. And if we apply to uh, uh, apply a neural network to this input, for example, to predict some chemical properties such as uh, binding energy to some receptor protein, we can again parse this input into a vector. But you can see now that 
any arrangement of the node features will do. Because in graphs and like images, we don't have any canonical or preferential way of ordering nodes. And molecules appear to be just one example of data with irregular non-Euclidean structure on which we would like to apply deep learning techniques. So other examples are social networks, which are gigantic graphs or different uh, interaction networks or interactomes in biological sciences, many folds and meshes in computer graphics and actually some models of proteins, for example, uh, that I will show later are also relying on this model. So all these are examples of data that waits to be dealt with in a principled way. So let me return back to this uh, example of multidimensional image classification that at first glance appeared to be hopeless because of the curse of dimensionality. Fortunately, we do have additional structure that comes from the geometry of the input signal, right? And this is something that we call geometric prior. And as we'll see, it is a general very powerful principle that gives us hope and optimism in dimensionality cursed problems. So in our example, in particular of image classification, the input image is not just a d-dimensional vector. It's a signal that is defined on some domain omega, that in this case is a two-dimensional grid. So I will denote the signals by x of omega, and I will use the, the red color to represent signals, right? So the structure of the domain uh, can be described by what is called the symmetry group. So in this case, it's a group of two-dimensional translations that act on the points on omega. So I will denote the points by u and the group elements by uh, this lowercase fractal g. And now in the space of signals, the group actions on the underlying domain are manifested through what is called the group representation that I denote here by rho. So in our example, again, it's a matrix that acts on the d-dimensional vector. And you can think of it as what is called the shift or translation operator. Now, this geometric structure of the domain under, that underlies our signal affects the function f that we are trying to learn. And we can have functions that are unaffected by the action of the group, what we call invariant functions. And a good example, again, is the image classification. And here, no matter where the cat is located in the image, we still want to say it's a cat. So this is an example of shift invariance. Now, on another example, we can have a case where the function has the same output as uh, input. And for example, in image segmentation, the output is also an image. It's a pixel-wise label mask. So we want the output to be transformed in exactly the same way as the input or what we call group equivariant function. So in this case, it's again, it's shift equivariance. Another type of geometric prior is what is uh, typically called scale separation. So this is the underlying principle of, for example, wavelength decomposition. And in some cases, we can construct a multi-scale hierarchy of domains, for example, by coarsening a, a grid in images. Let's say I denote it by omega prime. So coarsening requires some extra structure. It needs to assimilate nearby points on the domain uh, producing also a hierarchy of um, signals uh, spaces that are related by uh, an operator that I denote here by P, it's sometimes called the coarse graining. And in this coarse domain, we can define a coarse scale function that I denote here by F prime. And uh, we say that our function is locally stable if it can be approximated as the composition of the operator P and the coarse scale function. So basically I can downsample everything and then apply my classifier. And you can see that while the original function f might depend on long range interactions on the domain, in locally stable functions, it is possible to separate the interaction across scales by basically first focusing on localized interaction that then are propagated uh, towards the core scales. And this is, uh, again, a fundamental principle that you encounter everywhere in physics. So uh, one of the classical algorithms is what is called fast multiple methods that are used to represent uh, n particle interaction systems. And these two principles of uh, geometric priors give us a very general blueprint of geometric deep learning that you can probably recognize in the majority of popular deep neural network architectures. We can apply a sequence of equivariant layers, such as the convolutional layers in CNNs, and uh, possibly an invariant global pooling layer that aggregates everything into a single vector, right? Features of the entire image, for example. In some situations, if we also have the possibility to, to create a hierarchy of domains by using some coarsening procedure, we can, uh, for example, do uh, what typically is uh, max pooling in CNNs. And uh, I hope that you can recognize all these components in different um, architectures that, that are your favorite in your applications. And this is a very general design. It can be applied to different types of geometric structures, uh, for example, grids, global transformation groups, what is called homogeneous spaces, graphs, uh, manifolds. This is what we call the 4G of uh, geometric deep learning. And the implementation of these principles 
uh, in the form of inductive biases leads to some of the most popular architectures that exist today in deep learning, such as convolutional neural networks, that as I will show emerge from translational symmetry, graph neural networks, deep set transformers, and different uh, versions of intrinsic CNNs. So let me start with graphs. And uh, probably each of us has a different mental picture when we hear the word graph. For me, maybe because of my work at Twitter, I first think of a social network that models relations and interactions between different people. So mathematically, the users of a social network are modeled as nodes of the graph, and the relations uh, between users are pairs of uh, nodes or uh, what is called edges. And we can also assume that nodes have some features that are attached to them, d-dimensional vectors. Now, a key structure characteristic of a graph is that we don't have a canonical weight order of nodes. So when I uh, put some numbers on the nodes, I already define some arbitrary ordering of the nodes. So if we arrange the node feature vectors into a matrix of size n by d, and as the number of nodes in d is the dimension, we automatically prescribe some arbitrary ordering. And the same holds also for the adjacency matrix of the graph. Right, so uh, if we number the nodes differently, the rows of the feature matrix and the rows and the columns of the adjacency will be permuted by some permutation matrix P, which is an element of the permutation group uh, of a set of size n. So we have n factorial such elements. It's actually a very large group. Now, if we want to implement a function on the graph that provides a single output for the entire graph, like in our example of uh, a molecule for which we were to predict its binding energy, uh, we need to make sure that its output is unaffected by the ordering of the input nodes, what we call permutation invariant. Okay. Now, if we want to make node-wise predictions, for example, I want to classify some of the nodes in the graph, let's say detect some bad users in a social network, I want, in this case, the output of the function to change in the same way as the input with the reordering of the nodes, what we call permutation equivariance. Now, uh, as we'll see later, the most general form of such functions will be impossible to implement on graphs simply because the permutation group is too large. But uh, a tractable of uh, constructing a pretty broad class of such functions is using uh, the local neighborhood. Basically, we're looking at uh, nodes that are connected by an edge to an old i. And we can take the feature vectors. Technically, they form a multiset because uh, different nodes might have the same feature vector. And we apply some aggregation function to this multiset together with the feature vector of the node itself, I denote it by phi. So importantly, again, we don't have a canonical way to order the neighbors. So this function by construction must be a permutation invariant. And uh, if I apply it now to every node of the graph and stack the result into a feature matrix, I get a function that is permutation equivariant. And it appears that the way this local function phi is constructed is crucial and its choice determines the expressive power of the resulting architecture. And uh, when phi is injective, it can be shown that the neural network uh, design in this way is equivalent to the weiss feller lehmann graph isomorphism test. So it's a classical algorithm graph theory that tries to determine if the graphs are isomorphic. So here I should say that there are some recent works that showed it for graph neural networks, but actually these results are much older. And well, I can uh, mention here the, the classical paper of Sherrod Schitz and, and Bogart from uh, at least a decade preceding the, 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 the modern works on graph neural networks, but probably some of the, the uh, designs of graph neural networks that we know today, maybe in a different form and a slightly, a slightly different formulation, uh, go back uh, to uh, works in computational chemistry, probably at least to the 90s or maybe even before that. So let me just remind you what is uh, graph isomorphism. So we say that uh, two graphs uh, that are represented here by adjacency matrices A and A prime are isomorphic if there exists an edge preserving bijection between them. In other words, we can permute one matrix into another. And uh, basically what the weiss feller lehmann test tries to do is to uh, do some kind of iterative color refinement. So it starts with all the nodes of the graph having the same color, basically some form of discrete label. And then it applies a local injective function to uh, refine the color. And by virtue of uh, injectivity, it means that neighborhoods with different structure will be uh, mapped to different colors. And in this example, we have two types of nodes. We have nodes with uh, two neighbors and nodes with three neighbors. So they will become green and yellow in this uh, illustration. If I refine this procedure again, we now have three types of neighbors. We have yellow, yellow, we have yellow, green, green, and yellow, green and they will be mapped into violet, red, and gray. But if I apply it further, then the colors will not change anymore. So at this point, I can produce a histogram of colors. 
And if I apply the same procedure on another graph and I get a different histogram, then I can for sure say, say that the graphs are not isomorphic. But if the histograms are the same, we actually don't know. So it's a necessary but insufficient condition. And in fact, there are examples of graphs that are deemed uh, equivalent by the weiss feller lemon test, but they are not isomorphic. Like in an example shown here, we actually know that this test cannot count triangles uh, in graphs. And uh, there are many works that try to extend message passing schemes that we'll discuss to, to these higher order structures, uh, basically that come from computational topology. So let me go back to the, the way that uh, this local aggregation function looks like. So we have some permutation invariant aggregation that I denote by squares, such as sum and maximum, uh, a learnable function psi that transforms the neighbor features, and another function phi that, uh, that, that uh, updates the features of the node uh, uh, by using the uh, aggregate of the neighbor features. And I'm omitting a lot of nuances on how to design each of these components. This is actually a very active research topic in deep learning on graphs, but fortunately, most architectures fall into one of the three following flavors. So the first one is convolutional flavor. And this is how some of the early works on graph neural networks look like. They originated from spectral analysis on graphs. And in this setting, we aggregate neighbor features uh, uh, that basically weighted by some fixed coefficient CIJ that depend only on the structure of the graph. And we'll see that why the, the name convolution uh, uh, comes here because this scheme will boil down to the classical convolution on grids. So the second flavor is based on the tension and uh, the aggregation coefficients here depend on the features themselves. And there are multiple uh, uh, architectures that fall in this category. Probably the most prominent is the graph attention network uh, paper by Petra Vilichkovic. And uh, the most general flavor, uh, we have a nonlinear function that depends on both feature vectors of node i and j. Uh, we can regard it as a message that is sent to update the uh, features of node i. And graph neural networks of this type are called message passing. So in chemistry applications, they were first introduced by Justin Gilmer from DeepMind. In computer graphics, uh, our paper uh, with Yu Wang and Justin Solomon from MIT uh, is, uh, proposed essentially the same thing for, uh, for computer vision and graphics applications. And uh, if you look at the typical graph neural network architecture, you will immediately recognize uh, an instance of our geometric deep learning blueprint with the permutation group as the geometric prior. So we have a sequence of permutation equivariant layers. Typically, they are called propagation or diffusion in the literature, and uh, possibly a, a global pooling layer that produces a graph-wise readout. We can also uh, include local pooling layers. Some architectures do it. They are obtained by some form of uh, graph coarsening that can also be learnable. Okay. So let me now say a few words about some interesting special cases of graph neural networks. And the first uh, case is a graph with no edges. So basically, this is a set. And like the set of nodes in a graph, a set is unordered. So in this case, we can do two things. We can most straightforwardly consider each element of the set entirely independently and apply some shared function phi to the feature vectors. And this is a permutation equivariant function over the set. This is a special setting of a graph neural network. This is what is called deep sets in machine learning or point net architecture in computer graphics developed in the group of Leo Gibbs at Stanford. Now, as another extreme, instead of assuming that each element of a set acts on its own, we can assume that any two elements can interact. So this is now we have a complete graph. And in this case, the convolutional flavor makes no sense, obviously, because the aggregation is over all the set of nodes. And the second argument in this function becomes the same for all nodes. So we need to upgrade to the attentional uh, mechanism. And in this case, we can interpret the attention as some form of learnable soft adjacency matrix. So I hope you can recognize the famous transformer architecture that is now very popular in uh, NLP applications. It is also a particular case of a graph neural network. And I should say that transformers are commonly used uh, in sequential data where we, you do have an order of nodes. So this uh, node order information is typically provided in the form of what is called positional encoding. So it's an extra feature that uniquely identifies the node. And uh, similar approaches exist also for general graphs. There are many ways you can encode uh, the position or the structure of the nodes. So the, the example I show here is from a recent paper with my students, where we show that we can count small uh, graph substructures, such as triangles and clicks, and provide them as a kind of structural encoding that allows uh, the message passing mechanism to adapt to different neighborhood structure. So this is an architecture we call graph substructure network. We can show that it's strictly more powerful than the WL test. 
uh, with the proper choice of the substructure. And it's interesting, actually, you can uh, this way incorporate problem specific inductive bias. And if we go again back to this example of molecular graphs, in organic molecules, for example, cycles are prominent structures. Like you have things like aromatic rings. And again, if you look at the caffeine molecule, it has uh, rings of, of length six and rings of uh, uh, length five. And what we observe in experiments is that our ability to predict chemical properties of molecules improves dramatically if we uh, provide uh, counts of rings of a certain size, five or more. And uh, again, because this is a very meaningful inductive bias in uh, these applications. So you can see that even in the cases when the graph is not given as input, graph neural networks still make sense. And even when the graph is given, you don't necessarily need to stick to it to consider it some sacrosanct structure in order to do the message passing. In fact, a lot of recent approaches uh, decouple the computational graph from the input graph. And there are multiple ways you can do it, either in the form of sampling, usually to address uh, issues like scalability, such as the, the famous graph sage paper, uh, rewiring the graph to remove noise, so the recent paper from uh, Stefan Gunemann, or using uh, larger multi-hop filters, where the aggregation is performed on uh, uh, neighbors that are multiple hops removed. Now, you can also learn the graph on which to run a graph neural network that can be optimized for the downstream task. So I call this uh, setting latent graph learning. I think uh, 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 Matthias talked about it uh, earlier today. Uh, uh, there, there are multiple works in this direction. And uh, we can make this construction of the graph differentiable and back propagate through it. And this graph can also be updated between different layers of the neural network. And uh, uh, our first work that, that implemented this architecture, this uh, latent graph learning, was uh, what we call dynamic graph CNNs. And uh, we first applied it to computer vision and graphics applications working with 3D point clouds. And I think it's actually a good example uh, of point cloud segmentation. It actually shows nicely why it makes sense to have a dynamic graph. So at first, we use the graph to represent the local structure of the object. So we have a flow of information between nearby points in the point cloud, kind of crude representation of geometry. So it's better than applying the same function at every point. So we have some kind of small structure here. But as we go deeper into the network, our features capture increasingly more semantic information, such as telling apart, for example, two engines or two wings of the airplane. So the graph has to be adapted to allow to connect semantically similar points. And maybe in historical perspective, I think this latent graph learning idea can be related to methods that, that were called manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction. And um, the key premise of uh, manifold learning was that even though our data is high dimensional, it has low intrinsic dimensionality. And usually the metaphor that was used for, for this concept is this Swiss roll surface. We can think of our data points as sampled from some low dimensional manifold with very high co-dimension. And the structure of this manifold was typically captured by a uh, nearest neighbor graph that was then embedded by preserving some graph structures such as geodesic distances into a low dimensional space in which it is easier to do machine learning, such as clustering. And the reason why uh, these methods never really work beyond data visualization is that all these three steps are separate. And uh, it is obvious that, for example, the way that you construct the graph or even how you design the, the, the feature space has huge influence on how uh, the downstream task will look like. So uh, now with latent graph learning, you can bring a new life to these algorithms and maybe I arrogantly call it manifold learning 2.0. We now have a way to build an end-to-end -end pipeline in which we build both the graph and the filters that operate on this graph. Basically as a graph neural network with latent graph structure. And we recently used a new version of uh, this latent graph learning, we call differential graph module or DGM for uh, automated diagnosis applications. So that was our last year Mikai paper with uh, the group of Nasir Nawab from TUM. And we show that uh, this method consistently outperforms uh, the GNNs with handcrafted graphs. So here the graph is built uh, in an optimal way for the downstream task, which was automated diagnosis. So let me now move to another type of geometric structures that we are all familiar with, and these are grids. And grids are particular cases of graphs. What I show here, for example, is what is called a ring graph. So it's grid with periodic boundary condition. And uh, compared to general graphs, the first thing that you notice is that uh, a grid has fixed neighborhood structure. So here we have exactly two neighbors, the, the green and the blue. OK, and not only that, the order of the neighbors is fixed. I remind you that before on a general graph, we had to resort to our uh, permutation invariant aggregation function phi because we had a multi-set uh, of uh, neighbors that was unordered. 
Now we have sequential order of uh, nodes. We can always put, for example, the green, then the red, and then the blue. So if, for example, we choose a linear uh, aggregation function that is aggregated with a sum, we don't have any more permutation variant aggregation. We have a convolution, right? And in fact, if we write it as a matrix factor multiplication, we have a matrix with very special structure that is called circulant matrix. So it is a mathematical model for circular convolutions. And you see that circulant matrix is formed by shifted copies of a single vector of parameters that I denote here by theta. So these are exactly the learnable shared parameters in the CNN layer that I show here. Okay, so one thing that you need to know about circulant matrices is that uh, unlike general matrix multiplication, uh, they are commutative. So it means that AB equals BA. And in particular, they commute with a special circulant matrix that cyclically shifts the elements of a vector by one position, the shift operator. Okay, so circuit matrices commute with shift. And this is just another way of saying that convolution is a shift equivariant operation. So I should say that here many signal processing uh, uh, references, especially call it shift invariance, but uh, the correct mathematical term is shift equivariance. Okay, now this, this statement uh, also works in another direction. Not only that every circuit matrix commutes with shift, but also every matrix that commutes with shift is circuit. So we get is that convolution is the only linear operation that is shift equivariant. And I hope you can see here the power of this geometric approach. Basically, convolution is automatically emerges from translational symmetry. Now, I don't talk how about you, but when I studied signal processing, nobody explained where the convolution comes from. It was given as a formula that, that basically somehow steps out of the blue. And uh, unfortunately, this is also uh, the case with many deep learning practitioners that uh, sometimes you tend to, to apply these methods as a black box without really understanding the origins. Now, let me show you another nice thing. Uh, we also know from linear algebra that commuting matrices are jointly diagonalizable. Or basically, there exists a common basis in which all convolutions amount to pointwise products. They become diagonal matrices. And because all circular matrices commute, we can pick up one of them for the convenience of analysis. It is convenient actually to look at the eigenvectors of the shift. And surprise, surprise, the eigenvectors of the shift are nothing else but the discrete Fourier basis, the DFT. So all convolutions are diagonalized by the Fourier transform. And uh, you see that even this uh, basic fundamental construction as Fourier transform also comes out of a fundamental principle of translation symmetry, right? So if you wondered what is so special about Fourier transform, here you see it. It is actually part of a bigger picture that is called representation theory, but allow me to skip it. And this relation between the convolution and the Fourier transform, what is called the convolution theorem in signal processing, gives us two, way to two ways to perform convolution. It's either by multiplying by a circuit matrix that corresponds to a sliding window along our signal, or uh, in the Fourier domain element-wise product of the Fourier transform of the signal and the filter. And uh, on grids, you can do it efficiently because we have a redundancy in the Fourier matrix. And it, gives rise to what is called fast Fourier transform algorithms. I should say that in the graph learning literature, some of the first works, including my own, uh, used the second way uh, to generalize convolutions using the notion of uh, what is called the graph Fourier transform. So I hope I didn't say anything new so far. So let me uh, now move to a more general case where our group formalism will be more prominent. And uh, as we've seen, we can think of convolution as a kind of this pattern matching sliding window operation that slides uh, a filter over the image and uh, multiplies every time a different page of pixels in that image. Now, let me write it a bit more formally. So we need to define a shift operator that I denote here by T that shifts the filter, I denote it here by Psi, and an inner product that matches the filter to the image X, okay? So if we do it for every shift, we, we get the convolution or correlation. The difference is here is academic, actually what is called convolution in machine learning is usually correlation. Now, notice one special thing here that the translation group is actually identified with the domain itself because each element of the group, right, it's a translation, can be represented by a point on the domain into which we translate our filter, okay? Now, this is not the general case. And in general, we will have the filter transformed by some representation of our group that they've noted by Rho. So the convolution, right, or the knowledge of convolution now will have values for every element of the group, this lowercase factor g, okay? So we can easily show that this operation is equivariant under the, graph, uh, under the, the, the group action. 
and allow me to spare the technical details, it comes from the fact that the representation of the inverse of a group element is a joint. So you can move it uh, under the inner product. And you can also see the reason why we could not do this construction on graphs. Basically, the permutation group is too large. It has super exponential number of elements. So basically, we would have com to compute the, the output of this filter for every possible permutation, which is intractable. Right? So there is an implicit assumption here that if the group is discrete, it's small. If it's continuous, then it's low dimensional. Now, here's an example of how to do conversion on the sphere. So this is an example of a low dimensional manifold. And it's not some exotic construction. Actually, spherical signals are pretty important. They're important, let's say, in astrophysics, where a lot of observational data is naturally represented on the sphere. So here I'm showing the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation from primordial universe from the, the period of the Big Bang. Also in uh, representation of molecules, rotations play an important role. And uh, our group here is the, what is called the special orthogonal group SO3. So it's rotations preserving orientation. So if I represent every point on the sphere as a unit three-dimensional vector, then the action of the, the group on these points can be represented as an orthogonal matrix with determinant one that I denote by R, okay? So the conversion here is defined on SO3. So we get a, a value of inner product for every rotation R of the filter. Now, this is the case where the group is different from the, uh, from the structure of the domain. So the, the sphere is a two-dimensional manifold. SO3 is actually a three-dimensional manifold. You can rotate three ways on the sphere. You can rotate along the meridians, along the parallels, and around itself, right? So if we were to apply another layer of convolution, we would need to apply it on SO3. So now the output or, uh, of the first layer and the input to the second layer is uh, a three-dimensional manifold, SO3, right? So the points on this manifold are rotations themselves and that they denote here by Q. Now, you see that the sphere in this example, it's, it's an example of a non-Euclidean space uh, called a manifold, but it, it is still quite special. So every point on the sphere can be transformed into another point by an element of the symmetry group of rotations. Right? In geometry, we call such spaces homogeneous. Basically, homogeneous spaces are democratic. Every point is equal to any other point. I can map it to any other point. So basically, the key feature of such spaces is a global symmetry structure. And this global symmetry structure doesn't obviously hold for general manifolds. So let me introduce the last concept for today, what physicists call the gauge symmetry. OK, so one thing that we need to note when we apply a sliding window in an image is that it doesn't matter which way we go from one point to another. We'll always arrive at the same result. Now, uh, the situation is dramatically different on the manifold. Uh, if I go along the green path or the blue path, you will see that the result will be completely different. In differential geometry, this is called parallel transport. And the result of moving a vector on the manifold is path dependent, right? So now, I usually, it takes me quite a lot of time to explain basic concepts in differential geometry. So let me try to recap it in two minutes because I, I'm limited in time. And the crucial thing to start with, the difference between manifolds and Euclidean spaces is that manifolds are only locally Euclidean. So a small neighborhood around the point U is homeomorphic or topologically equivalent to Euclidean space. So in this case, it's a two-dimensional space that is called the tangent plane or the tangent space. So tangent vectors, basically vectors living in this space, we can manipulate them. We can uh, define an inner product that is called Riemannian metric. And uh, everything that is defined in, in terms of Riemannian metric is what is called intrinsic. So if I deform my surface in a way that doesn't change the metric, it's called an isometry. It's a metric preserving transformation. We'll see why it is important in a second. So I can do different things uh, locally on, in this tangent space. If I want to go back to the manifold, I need to apply what is called an exponential map. Okay, so it's a, a map that takes a unit step along a geodesic in a direction V at point U. Okay, so one key thing that you need to understand about tangent vectors or vectors in general, that these are abstract geometric entities that exist in their own right. So probably one of the worst crimes against humanity that is committed in uh, teaching linear algebra is that you are told that vectors are arrows or arrays of coordinates. So it's uh, neither arrows nor arrays of coordinates because in a general vector space, you don't have any notion of direction, right? This comes from uh, 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 an extra structure that is called an inner product. You don't have any notion of lengths. So this comes from an extra construction that is called the norm. In the same way, vectors are uh, abstract entities uh, 
they are, can only be thought of as arrays of numbers if you provide some reference frame. Right, so if I want to represent the vector on a computer, I need to provide some local reference frame. I denote it here by W. With respect to this frame, I can uh, represent my tangent vectors in this case as a, as a pair of two coordinates. Okay, now this frame is defined in an arbitrary way. And what we call a gauge is simply a way of choosing this local reference frame at every point on the manifold in a way that depends smoothly on the position. So if I were to change the reference frame, let's say from yellow to red, I can do it by applying what is called a gauge transformation. So it's a group valued function of the manifold. So in general, it can be what is called the general linear group, any vertical matrix. It is convenient to work with orientation preserving rotations. So again, we have the special orthogonal group in this case, S of two, these are rotations in the plane. Sometimes it's called the structure group of the tangent bundle of the manifold in differential geometry. So uh, Basically, if we look at two gauges, there is there always exists an element of this structure group, a two-dimensional rotation that uh, translates one gauge into another. It might be different at each point. So here is the main difference from homogeneous spaces that this transformation is not global, it is local. Okay. So if I now want to do convolution on manifolds, I have multiple options. So let's say that we have a scalar function on the manifold, and at each point u we can represent it in this local two-dimensional system of coordinates. So basically I have an exponential map that goes, I go to the manifold and to fetch the value of the function, right? And I multiply it by a filter of psi that is also defined in the plane. So this is a direct analogy of the sliding window that we had before, right? Now, if I fix the gauge, the story ends here essentially. And this was in fact, one of the first works we did for deep learning on manifolds that we call the mesotropic CNNs. Now, the main difficulty here, at least theoretically is, uh, this approach requires some mechanism to compute canonical gauges of manifolds. Now, in theory, this is not possible. In practice, it is. And we actually had a paper at CPR last year, uh, we called G-frames for computing stable local frames on point clouds and meshes. So there are some uh, ugliness, for example, there will be a few points where this frame is not defined. So it, actually there are uh, theoretical results, what is called the Poincare-Hopf theorem or Hairy ball theorem that tells you that, for example, on a sphere, you cannot have a, a non-vanishing smooth vector field. Basically, if you think of uh, a hairy uh, head, then you will have a vortex of hair at, at one point. Okay, but in practice, you can just ignore these things and uh, uh, construct a stable reference frame and it, it works in practice reasonably well. Another alternative is to make the filter equivariant to rotations, which in this setting, because it's a, a scalar thing, uh, it is unaffected by rotations, right? So basically it will be invariant to rotations. And uh, as a result, you get radially symmetric uh, isotropic filters. Right? Isotropic, I mean that they're agnostic to directions. And in a sense, this is a situation that we had in graphs, right? Because we didn't have any way to canonically order the neighbors. But on manifolds, we see that we do have more structure. Instead of permutation invariance, we have, uh, orientation ambiguity, basically how to rotate our, our, uh, our local frame, right? So isotropic filters do throw a lot of uh, important information. So actually all the spectral approaches uh, uh, result uh, in isotropic filters. So another way is to use an anisotropic filter. So I have a directional sensitive uh, uh, filter, but I apply it for all possible rotations and then aggregate the results with, for example, Angular max pooling and it's kind of matching uh, rotating mask. So that was the very first architecture for deep learning on manifolds we call geodesic CNNs. And uh, well, in uh, retrospective, it was probably uh, the, the, the simplest but the ugliest uh, thing to do. Um, and if we want to work with uh, vectors, you need to take into account that you cannot simply uh, transport a vector from one point to another. And I remind you that the uh, the, the values of x, we are taking them from different points than you. So we need some form of parallel transport. And uh, to make a long story short, we can design what is called uh, gauge equivariant uh, convolution operations. That was a light of work from uh, Taco Coin and uh, Max Wedding. And you can also see here, maybe in a more nuanced way, again, the comeback of our geometric deep learning blueprint. So we have deformation invariants, basically by considering uh, intrinsic definition of the filters that are invariant under uh, isometries, isometric deformations of the surface, and uh, also uh, equivariants uh, with respect to the structure group of the tangent bundle of the manifold, basically the change of the gauge. And uh, 
if you wonder why at all do we care about manifolds, one of the reasons that is that in computer graphics and vision, manifolds or their discretizations, uh, usually in the form of meshes, are a standard way of modeling 3D objects. And what we gain from our geometric perspective is filters that are defined intrinsically, and as a result, they become uh, invariant under inelastic deformations. And you can see in the example on the right that the filter that is kind of drawn on the surface uh, is unaffected by the deformation. So this brings me probably to the first uh, example of application that has to do with the topic of, of today's workshop is uh, uh, dealing with, with drugs, right, or biomolecules. And uh, we are using uh, manifolds as a way of uh, representing uh, protein, uh, protein molecules. So proteins, as you know, uh, they're, they're big uh, biopolymers. You can represent them either as atomic point clouds or as graphs or as secondary structures. So molecular surface, we argue, is a good representation when we want to model uh, protein interactions. And the reason is that it uh, abstracts out the internal fold of the protein that might be irrelevant for uh, dealing with or predicting the way that it uh, interacts with uh, some ligands. And you can see an example here. So uh, when the small molecule binds to this protein, it doesn't see what happens inside. It sees only this uh, transparent molecular surface. So surface uh, based representation is uh, a good way of capturing only the relevant structure of the protein. And there are many other reasons why actually working intrinsically with the manifold is a good idea. Typically, you see some pocket-like structures that, that bind uh, the, small, uh, the small molecules. And also, proteins are non-rigid surfaces. When uh, they bind to something, their conformation might deform. And as a result, uh, working intrinsically at least affords you some, some level of deformation invariance. So uh, with my collaborators from EPFL, uh, Bruno Correa uh, in the Protein Engineering Lab, we developed uh, a, de a geometric deep learning architecture we call Massif that essentially implements these ideas. So it's an intrinsic uh, convolutional neural network that decomposes the protein molecular surface into patches and uh, uses uh, both geometric and chemical features to uh, compute um, uh, some problem specific uh, uh, local features or lo local descriptors or local fingerprints. And we used this architecture for predicting uh, possible uh, interface sites for protein interactions. Uh, classifying pockets, basically what kind of uh, ligand the protein binds, and also do a uh, fast protein-to-protein uh, -protein interaction search. And this is an example of how it works. So in this case, we have a pd one uh, cancer immunotherapy target. We can predict where this uh, protein will bind another protein, and we can try to build de novo another protein that will bind to this target. And this, uh, you know, probably better than, than myself, this is an interesting, promising direction for the design of uh, what is called biological drugs or biologics. Basically, these are large uh, proteins or peptides that uh, uh, can address uh, otherwise probably uh, nearly undruggable uh, uh, PPI interfaces, such as, uh, the, the, for example, the program death ligand that is used uh, often in, in cancer uh, immune therapy. So this appeared on the cover of Nature Methods uh, last year, uh, probably one of the first geometric deep learning uh, papers ever to be to, to appear in such, such a journal. And we now already have uh, examples of designs that are actually work in practice. So we have what I show here are three designs that, that were experimentally confirmed to, to bind to PDL1. You can see actually that the proteins that we design are completely different. So the, the structures here, for example, one has a single helix, another one has double helixes. And uh, here you can see also the, uh, uh, the crystal structure. So we actually have now uh, experimental confirmation that, uh, that that shows that, that the predicted structure, the, the design binder, and the, the actual protein that that we observe, in, uh, that, that we observe in, uh, with uh, X-ray crystallography, is uh, uh, coincides very accurately, less than one angstrom uh, root mean square error. Now, if we look at graphs, they are really ubiquitous, so we can describe practically any system of relations and interactions as, uh, as a graph from uh, nanoscales modeling individual molecules uh, to microscales, basically modeling uh, interactions of different biomolecules or metabolites and so on, to the macro scale, basically where you can model, for example, patient networks. And uh, probably uh, geometric deep learning is uh, most promising in these applications in biological sciences, in drug design or in drug repositioning. And you know better than me that uh, the bringing a new drug to, to, to market 
is very expensive and very uh, long business, takes more than a decade and costs more than a, a billion dollars. Uh, and one of the reasons is that the cost of testing and diff different uh, screening stages uh, is very high. Most of the drugs fail at some of these stages. So uh, another, uh, another interesting application where graph neural networks are being used is what is called virtual screening. So if you look at the space of possible drug-like molecules that can, in principle, it can be chemi chemically synthesized, it is very large, right? So it's combinatorial complex space of something like 10 to the power of 60 possible combinations. On the other hand, we can test uh, maybe a few hundreds or a few thousands compounds in, in the clinic. So this huge gap has to be uh, bridged computationally. And graph neural networks really excel in the past couple of years uh, in uh, providing accuracy that is similar to traditional methods such as DFT, but being orders of magnitude faster. And in fact, uh, these approaches were used by the group of Jim Collins at MIT. Uh, they had a paper in Cell last year where they used GNNs to predict antibiotic activity of different molecules. And they showed uh, a new uh, powerful antibiotic compound they called halicin that actually originated, I think, as a candidate anti-diabetic drug. Now, going to uh, maybe a higher level of abstraction, another promising direction is what is called drug repositioning or combinatorial therapy, where you use existing safe drugs for either different targets or in combination in hope to find some synergistic effect. And uh, graph neural networks are also uh, promising here. Uh, so I, what I show here is from the work of Marinka Zitnik that tries to try to predict side effects of drug combinations, pairwise combinations using uh, PPI, protein-to-protein -protein interaction graphs. And uh, I'm involved in a big uh, collaboration with Mila and the, the Gates Foundation, where we try to find synergistic uh, drug combinations against uh, COVID-19. So I think I'm out of time. Uh, let me uh, conclude. And uh, we started with this uh, somewhat irreverent desire to imitate the Erlangen program in machine learning, trying to derive uh, different uh, deep learning architectures from basic principles of invariance and symmetry. And this took us all the way from image classification to drug design. And uh, the approaches we've seen today are actually instances of this common blueprint of geometric deep learning, where the architecture or the inductive bias emerges from the assumptions of the domain uh, that underlies the data and its symmetry group, whether it's uh, grids with the translations, graphs with permutations, or manifolds with isometries or gauge transformations. And I hope I convince you that, that geometric deep learning is really a unifying framework for deep architectures that allows to relate different methods to common principles. And uh, these methods have exploded in the past few years, especially uh, with regards graph neural networks. There are already multiple uh, success stories, especially in the industry, some state-of-the-art results and many tough problems, particularly in biology. And I think as to the promise of these methods, it's quite indicative, in my opinion, that uh, last year, two major biological journals featured geometric deep learning uh, papers on their cover. One was the MIT paper on antibiotic discovery, and another one was our paper on proteins. So I hope that uh, this and next few years, these methods become mainstream and first class citizens in the ML community and possibly lead to some new exciting results in fundamental science. So last but not least, uh, let me acknowledge all my amazing collaborators in uh, these and other projects. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Michael, for this excellent talk. It was a pleasure to, to watch this talk and to, to listen to you in this exciting field of, of, of uh, geometric deep learning. Are there any questions? We still have some time for questions. So there are two questions in the in the Slido channel, in fact, which I will read out. Can you recommend a review or textbook a chapter that gives an introduction to geometric deep learning from definitions over theorems, proofs up to applications? Well, excellent question. So there are several books on graphs, on deep learning on graphs. So Will Hamilton has recently a book. I should uh, confess that basically this talk is a kind of a trial of uh, a book that I'm currently writing with uh, John Bruna, uh, uh, Taco Coin, and Petro Vilichkovic. So that's why I mentioned that it's a collaboration with these uh, with with, uh, with these colleagues. Uh, so I think it's rather. I, I don't think that uh, it's that there is anything new here. I think it's just a nice perspective. So if we manage to present it uh, pedagogically enough, it will probably also survive 
the particular fashion with implementation, like deep, deep learning, and it can probably transcend uh, the, the particular methods, I think, principles. As Elvetsos uh, put it, uh, the, lack, uh, the, the knowledge of certain principles compensates for the lack of knowledge of uh, certain facts. So that, that's our aspiration. I hope that we'll be able to be around that. I read a joke yesterday that there are so many reviews on graph convolutional networks now that you need a review of the reviews. Um, <laughs> next, so that somehow fits this question. Volker Dresspel has a, has a question. Volker, please. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Michael, great talk, um, very inspiring. Um, so uh, I want to ask you about uh, human perception. Um, uh, there seem to be a lot of invariances, but it's not completely invariant, I would think. So is it because uh, humans are not good at uh, group theory or are there some biological or other way uh, motivating reasons behind that? Right, so this is a fantastic question. So this is very important. Uh, another geometric prior or geometric construction that I didn't mention, this is what we call geometric stability. So indeed, as you're saying, for example, uh, even in images, right, uh, you uh, very, very seldom have really a, a, a translation operation, right? So if you think of a video, let's say two objects are moving in different directions, so only locally they can be described by, by a translation group. So uh, you can still quantify it. You can say that you have some deformation, some automorphism on the domain that uh, is close enough to a translation, right? So you need some metric to define it. Uh, it can be defined in many different ways. So you can think of maybe a smooth deformation field for which you can measure, let's say, the Dirichlet energy. So what we can show that if it is close enough to an element of the group, then we can get approximate uh, invariance or equivariance. And actually, uh, if you think of wavelets, that's exactly how wavelets were born. So they uh, they come where, where the Fourier transform from level. It is not it is invariant invariant to shifts, but it's not invariant to to, to approximate shifts to deformations. Wavelets are. And uh, Joan Brunner had in 2012 uh, a paper on scattering networks or scattering transform with Stefan Mala, where they showed actually this property and they related it to convolutional neural networks. So one of the things, for example, why do we use maximum pooling in uh, convolutional neural networks? So it has to do exactly with these uh, local uh, deformations. So convolutional neural networks actually are not only shift equivalent. The use of pooling has uh, much uh, more powerful implications in making them uh, at least approximately invariant to, to these local deformations. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, I think invariants are quite, uh, well, maybe, uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, extremely important, but uh, they are also not perfect, really. You have to, I, I think in, in uh, single processing, if you, if you uh, design the optimal rotational shift invariant, whatever filter, I think it becomes pretty trivial and not necessarily very useful, uh, at least that's how I remember it. So I think it's it's sort of the tension between probably, I mean, it would be my statement between invariances and, and exceptions from that as well. So here we try to design it a, a, in an equivariant way. So we don't lose this information, but uh, it is accounted it is accounted properly in the subsequent layers. So of course, the, one of the, the requirements that in order for it to be tractable, that the, the dimensionality of this group is small, if it's a continuous transformation, if it's a leak group, uh, I should also say that, of course, this uh, geometric stability exists also for graphs. So there are several works. Well, uh, I mentioned Joan, he had a paper, uh, we had a paper as well, uh, basically that shows, for example, that spectral filters uh, are insensitive to the perturbations of the underlying graph. So there are many flavors of these results. So this is important. It's uh, because, of course, uh, ideal invariance doesn't exist. If you can show stability, then you can uh, build into your architecture some invariance that is meaningful and everything that deviates from this invariance, which is uh, how real life looks like, uh, only that should be learned. And this gives you uh, already an architecture that, that, that has certain built-in properties that are meaningful. Of course, it depends on the problem, whether, for example, you want to have rotation invariance in images, but if you have, you better incorporate this inductive bias. Okay, thanks a lot. Michael, there's a question. Um... Uh, again, in Slido, is there a difference between your definition of graph substructure network in form of triangles and cliques and the graphlets of the previous talk by Natasha Purchul, the statistics of subgraphs counts? Um, it, it is very much related. Uh, so uh, indeed, well, we actually cite some of Natasha's uh, papers in, as an inspiration. So, uh, so graphlets have uh, been uh, uh, known in biological domains forever, I think, from the paper uh, of Milo in Science, where they showed the, the distribution of these uh, graph motifs or graphlets uh, 
in uh, uh, real world networks is very different from, from random graphs. So they do have uh, um, uh, prominence in certain data sets. So you know, for example, that in social networks, clicks are important, in molecules, cycles are important. So we just show a way uh, how to incorporate it in message passing algorithms. Again, nothing uh, particularly uh, interesting there. I think the more interesting results are uh, the theoretical analysis. We show that it creates uh, an expressiveness hierarchy that is outside the, 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 the traditional Weisfeller-Lehmann hierarchy, the, the KWL test. Uh, so we can be strictly more powerful than KWL. Uh, there are, of course, um, higher order graph neural networks that are equivalent to KWL, but they are non-local and they have higher computational complexity. So with this approach, we have a pre-processing stage that, that counts the substructures. It can, in the worst case, absorb high complexity and to the K. But in practice, it is actually low polynomial complexity. Then the message passing itself is linear and uh, and, and local. So basically, you have the nice uh, all the nice properties of uh, message passing in graph neural networks with uh, strictly more uh, powerful expressive power. Thank you. I have one uh, final question. Uh, yeah. So there are no further questions. I have one final question for you from a bioinformatics point of view. When I look at these papers, these, these applications of, of geometric deep learning and graph convolutional networks in the, in the sciences and the successes that you showed, so some of these are really impressive. Um, I notice that in the list of authors, there's, there's always like a, a, a specialized uh, graph machine learning author. So the technology has not advanced to a point where um, the bioinformaticians let alone the, the biologists could use the technology directly, it seems. So it, it so the applications always seem to require specialized um, knowledge in the field from a from a dedicated graph machine learner. May, so first of all, do you share this impression? Second, how far are we from this no longer being the case? Yeah. Well, uh, my, my hope is obviously, so I, I do share it at least to some extent. This is what I see, or maybe uh, it is a graph learning uh, uh, experts or well, people that work on graph learning, which is actually quite a lot now in, in the machine learning community. They are attracted by these applications because they're important and the impact can be uh, uh, tangible and, 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 and big. Uh, it might be also the other way around that, that bioinformaticians are attracted by these shiny new uh, class of architectures. So probably it's a kind of uh, confluence. Uh, I think we're probably a couple of years away from uh, these tools are already uh, out there in uh, standard packages like uh, PyTorch Geometric or DGL, something that didn't exist for a couple, a couple of years ago. So these are already uh, the standard implementations of these uh, of these methods that uh, practically anyone can take an off the shelf implementation of a graph neural network, adapt it to, to his or her problem, and you get uh, you get something that at least some some reasonable baseline. Uh, it is probably a little bit pink view on the field. There are many subtleties that, that are important. But well, one of the reasons, I guess, why uh, I'm uh, uh, so much uh, advocating these methods is that, that they're, uh, they, they become more uh, mainstream. I think they are becoming. I, I see uh, uh, the, the, the surge of interest, especially in, in the bioinformatics community. So I think it's, it's a matter of yep. very short which is a bad, bad thing for me because then I will be useless. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but I thank you very much uh, on behalf of myself and the entire network and the YouTube audience for this exciting talk that you have given and the question and answer session. That was a, a great, uh, another great highlight of this.